Good afternoon, listeners and readers of Positive Psychology News Daily. Senya Maiman, my co-editor, and I have decided that we would like to present something new on the site. That is, we would like to bring you a series of interviews with researchers and Positive Psychology News Daily authors so that you actually see people talking about the things that they're passionate about. Just to get ourselves started, we decided to begin by interviewing each other. So today, I'm Catherine Britton. I'm going to edit Senya Maiman, the Editor-in-Chief of Positive Psychology News Daily, and I'm going to ask her to start out by telling us a little bit about yourself, please, Senya. I did a 180-degree change in my career. The first thing that I ever did career-wise was I majored in math and economics at Harvard and then went on to work at Morgan Stanley. So Wall Street job, very math, very economics. And after that, I came to business school at Stanford. I often say to Marty Seligman that he changed my life. And I, I do believe that because before, I wouldn't have even thought of psychology. So I did this master's program and after that became an executive coach for a couple of years. During that time, I became so interested in research. I was one of Marty's assistant instructors for his course in the master's program at UPenn. I became so interested in research that I applied to PhD programs and have just a year ago finished the PhD program at Stanford in organizational behavior, where I studied motivation and how to get unstuck and coaching frameworks. So basically that is the 180 degree turn. And I think that's what um, I hear from some of my coaching clients that they like that I have that analytical background. So I will dissect an issue with them, but I will also be encouraging and supportive and help them look towards what is possible. So that's my history to now, and I'm an executive coach and consultant primarily to technology companies these days. And we must forget that you're also the author of a recently published book, Profit from the Positive. Thank you. So, so uh, my colleague, uh, Catherine, and, and my colleague, Margaret Greenberg, was also with us in that first year class. And Margaret and I have worked on this book literally for about five years, up until it got released over a year, about a year ago uh, by McGraw-Hill Professional. It's Profit from the Positive. And what's nice is it, it really answers the questions that Margaret and I had been hearing as executive coaches. What can I do to improve productivity? What can I do to get my team to work together? So we look to the research and to case studies and put that all together. So in that context, you're a researcher and an author. What would you say that your favorite positive psychology research study or concept would be? I'll tell you how I came to it so that you can kind of follow my tra train of thought. In 2005, when you and I were in the master's program, we got introduced in a class to to the idea of self-regulation and the benefits of things like being your forebrain and how in control you can be of the decisions you make. And that was linked a lot to goals and goal theory and just how you can be very, very predictive and really set and really direct where you're moving towards in life. And I loved studying that. I loved studying self-regulation and goal theory. Just to give some of our viewers a, a case history, one of the earliest studies of self-regulation was getting college students to pay attention to their posture for two weeks. And the researchers found that both Catherine and I quickly perked up our posture, just saying the word posture and improves our posture. The researchers found that paying attention to your posture, which is a type of self-control and self-regulation, led to increased self-regulation in other things that the students were doing. I think in that study it increased, it led to better study habits and more organization, some, some concepts like this. I thought that was phenomenal, that something could spill over if you're practicing it in one place. And then, uh, while I think that research is great, personally I got disenchanted with it. And that probably came from the fact that you can do a lot with goals, you can do a ton with goals, but what if they're just not working for you in some domain in your life? Like they're just not working for you in exercise, or they're just not working in some aspect of your professional life. What do you do then if goals are the holy grail, what do you do then? And I heard a, a professor, uh, Sri Kumar Rao, describe willpower, or really your effort and will to change behavior, as doing violence to yourself. And that was impactful to me, because I thought, well, if that is doing violence to yourself, then what is not doing violence to yourself? And his point is that you really need to make lasting change by being aligned with, the, with what you're moving towards. Whereas if you're just constantly telling yourself, do this, do this, do this, do this, 
it's it's stressful on yourself before you even get the thing done. And then I really found the research that I love. And so here's the answer to your question. There is a researcher named Wendy Wood, and she and her colleague have studied habits um, for decades. And I love her work on habits. I think it complements so well the vast and useful literature on goal setting. What I really love about habits is that it, it lets you get a lot done. So if you're setting a habit, if you're doing something, let's say five minutes a day, you're getting things done. As opposed to if you set a goal, you might procrastinate or procrastinate until you start that goal. So she, she has a lot of examples of how habits help you get things done. I have one from my research um, at Stanford. One study that I ran was with job seekers. And in one condition, I asked job seekers to work on their job, um, sending out resumes, contacting people for 15 minutes per day. In another condition, I asked them to work for one three-hour chunk. And in terms of our dependent variable, how many resumes they sent out, how many contacts they, uh, they contacted, how much effort they put in, the people that were spending 15 minutes a day did a lot more work than those that spent a three-hour chunk. But if you think about it, three, 15 minutes times five is nowhere near three hours. But it made them put in a lot more effort, that consistency, that effort over time. Margaret and I really highlight this in Profit from the Positive. Uh, we say that set habits, not just goals. But just on a personal level, I see that when I'm coaching somebody, if they can start a habit that helps, whether it's a habit once a week or once a day, it can move them further. So I hope that answers your question, but it's kind of my own evolution of self-regulation to goal setting to habits that complements the other two. And for me, in my view, is, is more powerful. Very interesting result. So let me, let me ask you to carry that one step further. As an executive coach, what do you find to be the most powerful concept from positive psychology that you use in your coaching? And I suspect it's probably related to that, isn't it? It's, it's uh, uh, to a very large degree related to habits. I think it would go one degree further. So something that you and our colleague Marie-José Char worked on a lot, have worked on a lot, which is the mind-body connection. Uh, <laughs> just to even start, I, uh, here's, here's what I find in coaching. If uh, a client, a coaching client, an executive, it, so let's say a director at a technology company is interested in making effort in terms of moving his own career forward. Let's use that as an example. If during the course of our coaching, that person also sets some body goals, and that can be up to that person what those body exercises are. So it can be more meditation. It can be more yoga. It can be a different quality of meditation. It can be training for a marathon, wherever, that, wherever the coaching meets that person. When a person sets a challenge in the body realm, that so completely influences the challenge that person is setting in the work realm. I can't tell you, uh, it's a night and day difference between those clients who do make an effort to, to do a body exercise and to set one that's challenging for themselves and the results that they get in their work lives over the course of our working together. And it can be small things. So one client said that they want to get it to a certain heart rate on the treadmill. It can be um, one client said, I'm going to do this many push-ups for five minutes a day. So, literally, so it can be incremental, but you're making an effort on where you want to make an effort. So I think that's, that's a big one, that mind-body mind connection. That is I, I, the mind's not sitting there all by itself. It's actually sitting there in a body. And so paying attention to that connection makes a difference. It's, they're here. You know, I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. They're here. It's not, it's not just that or just they're here. They're both here. Right, Hello. Right. Uh, I'd love to add one more. I think you would probably find that you find this in your coaching practices as well. And let me know if you do. There's some research by a researcher, McRae, and colleagues on procrastination. And um, I won't give the, the psychology technical term for it, but basically, when you are focused on details, you are less likely to procrastinate. When you're focused on the how, the when, the what, what you're doing, you are more likely to get things done. When you're focused on the big picture, or what do I really want, or how will, how will this end up in the future, then you are more likely to procrastinate. So that is a result of, of research. Now, how do I apply that with my coaching clients? At the end of every phone call, as we have been detail-focused during the call and really working on whatever the work issue is, 
I make sure that in that phone call, the client commits to and decides on what they're going to do between this session and the next session. Sometimes I even ask the client while we're on the phone to send me an email describing that commitment. So here's what I commit to, here's what I will do. It decreases procrastination. It also gives the client something to look at. What did I say, Senya? What did I say to Senya I was going to do? So it just it it moves the process forward. I think putting it in writing also helps a lot there too, probably. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gears now and ask you a question related to Positive Psychology News Daily. As a co-editor of the site, you've been involved in it since January the 1st, 2007, when we opened up the doors with our first articles. What would you say the main benefits of PPMD are for the readers of the site? I, I, I'm glad you asked. I, I think about that a lot because you and I talk about it. What are people getting out of it? What are the more than 100 authors getting out of it? What are the over 8,000 readers or the 40,000 Twitter followers? What are they getting out of it? Uh, I was just joking to you before the call, actually, that I was wondering whether we should change the tagline of Positive Psychology News Daily to we write stories or we create stories. I think about that because I think when I have been most engaged in following some of the authors on the site, it's because of the stories that those reader, those authors create. And we, we, you and I have found that a lot of comments get put on a particular, excuse me, on a particular article when there's, uh, when there's a little controversy in the article, when there's a little bit of description of a story or, or opposing research findings. So I'll give you a few examples. For example, Sherry Fisher and Christine, du Christine Duvivier, as two examples, write about education. And when they write about education, they don't just find research in positive psychology related to education. They often overlay it with their own experience in coaching a young person or in discussions with the parents of a young person. And that overlap, I think, really brings the research to life. That's an education example. Again, our colleague, Marie-Josée Marie Char, she's been writing so much on nutrition and exercise and sleep, but she relates it to specific, her own experiences or client experiences. I think that's what gives it uh, air or life or breath, is there's research, but how do you make it come to life or where have you seen it come to life? Or your work, I think a lot of, about a lot of the things that you've written, Catherine, as resilience or resilience related. Uh, for example, <laughs> you wrote this article, I think, probably five years ago, but so often I will forward this to a client or a colleague and I'll say, read uh, item five of this article by Catherine on gratitude. This is gratitude for the things that didn't happen. So it's an example of you walking <laughs> in the woods and you fell and you, your leg got all scraped up, but you, you were okay. You could walk. So gratitude for the worst things that didn't happen. I just think it's a wonderful concept and it's a useful research concept. And when you relate it to a real story, it, it just brings it to life. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears again and ask you to give us another idea from Profit from the Positive, your new book, that you think would be particularly useful to our listeners today. Just one idea. There are lots of ideas in that book, but just pick one and, and give us a quick... Okay, I, my pleasure. I'm very glad you asked. I like these surprise questions. Uh, free, frequent recognition and encouragement. And free is free. So you can give frequent the recognition and encouragement freely. Why is this useful to our listeners and viewers? We know that it's, it feels nice when somebody says something specific and appreciative to you about an action you took or something you did that really was valuable to them or helped them. But I don't think that we think about that as much when we're running a project or when we're in charge of getting people together. Just noticing small things, small process things in what people have done and really calling those out, letting people know that thing that you did, that very specific thing, that was really helpful to person A and B and to me. I know it's very simple. I know it's, it's a, a simple, simple concept. I think we love it when it happens to us and we don't think about it as much proactively in terms of, oh, who can I give a free to? I love that term when, when Margaret and I started thinking about it because it's, it's, so, it's almost tangible. Like, who can I physically hand this free to? To whom can I say, you really helped us by doing that? So that's a concept I'm glad to share. And I just like to remind readers that there is an article in PPND, a few years old, that actually has free in the title where, where Senya and Margaret explain this idea. 
So you can have a chance to go and read about it if you choose. So one last question. Could you describe a positive psychology practice that, that you bring into your own life that affects you know, your, your general well-being? Uh, it, it's a it's a mix between Ben Franklin and positive psychology. Uh, you, do you remember this part about how Ben Franklin documented 13 things that he wanted to work on? Yes. He made pretty much an Excel spreadsheet for those of us who are listening who don't. <laughs> I, I would say it's like an early Excel spreadsheet where it was uh, 13, was it temperances? So it's virtues, 13 virtues he wanted to work on. One of them was temperance, another was uh, humility. So these, these are things he wanted to work on. And every week he would mark a dot when he's not doing that thing. And his goal was to do that thing, whatever it is, being humble or being thoughtful to people, whatever it might be. And I find that when I really want to focus on something, whether it's um, creating a more business in a certain area or bringing more people as authors or as readers to PPNG or exercise, once I start to document things, it really helps. Uh, which is which is absolutely tied to the research finding that you and I just discussed about habits and routines and documenting the incremental progress. I really love the word incremental in terms of psychology. I think one way that I might characterize positive psychology is as change psychology. It's really about how can people change? How can you yourself change? How can other people change? And when you think about change, that incremental change can really bring you to a lot of places. So I'll end with uh, from Ben Franklin to positive psychology to Jerry Seinfeld. One of Jerry Seinfeld, and this is all over the web, but one of his productivity techniques is marking X's on the calendar. So he will put up a huge calendar and for a day when he has worked on jokes and made jokes, he will put an X and then a next X for the next day and so on. And his goal is to not break the cycle of X's. And that keeps him motivated. You know what's really interesting? He, Benjamin Franklin, made an X when he didn't do what he wanted to do. So I guess it, it, is know, it might be interesting to see which of those two approaches would be the most productive. So, Where's your hunch? Which, which one would you bet on? Oh, I would say that doing what you want to do and marking it is probably better than marking when you don't. Because it's like an approach goal as opposed to an avoidance goal. And so, I'm totally with you. So if I had to bet on that study, I would bet on Seinfeld over Franklin. <laughs> okay. So on that note, let me say goodbye, Senya, and thank you so much for sharing your, your thoughts with us today.